I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Cheever, who will introduce our first speaker, Dr. Cheever. It's great. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce one of our co-chairs, Allison Agu, to talk about uh, who is a professor of adult and pediatric infectious diseases at Johns Hopkins uh, School of Medicine, who will talk to us about uh, preventing H HIV related comorbidities in adolescents. Uh, thank you uh, for being here, uh, Allison, for all the work you've done uh, throughout this conference. Fantastic. All righty. Oh, these are my disclosures. And my learning objectives, as always, are, are several fold. So first, to just review the epidemiology of adolescents living with HIV here in the US, and to describe some risk factors for developing comorbidities over their life course among adolescents. And then really we'd like us to talk about opportunities to prevent comorbidities and to optimize their outcomes. So I love this slide that I developed for, for IA's conference, just really highlighting the, the story of HIV and, and specifically highlighting the story of HIV as it relates to, to young people from the first infant known to, to be born with HIV to advent of AZT and the like, the first infant to be cured from, for remission from HIV, just to show how, many, how far we've come with HIV among young people in particular. In fact, we've come so far that the age of distribution of persons living with diagnosed HIVs is apparently they acquired HIVs changed dramatically. In fact, the large majority of individuals who are born with HIV are 13 and older with about 40% over the age of 25. And so Mike's point about many of them in our adult clinics is absolutely correct. There are many are in our adults clinic and, and, and lost or not, not necessarily recognized, right? And many of these young people who are born with HIV are thriving. And this is just a, a, a full one graphic just showing many of them uh, who are out with their HIV and, and are doing extremely well. I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the large majority of individuals or adolescents who are, are living with HIV or those who have acquired HIV non-perinatally. And what this slide shows is that about one in five individuals who require HIV in the US are between the ages of 13 to 24. So making up that bulk of the young people. And when we look at who they are and how they are, I don't think I have to tell this audience that those individuals who are living with diagnosed HIV between the age of 13 to 24, um, the majority are male. But when you look in the male population, about 10% of those are living with diagnosed HIV are perinatally acquired. And among females, about 41% of them. And that does not mean that they're, you're more likely to survive if you're a, a female who lives with perinatal acquired HIV. It's just they're shared greater numbers of young men who are acquiring HIV, so making the percentage um, seem you know, smaller for perinatal. Uh, as we know, the, the, the story for HIV among young people is the same as it is for older in terms of being a story of, di of disparities, and where we see African-American and Latino individuals making up a significant proportion of those living with HIV um, how far pacing their rates in the population. And this matters as we talk about comorbidities, et cetera, because we have to think about intersectionality of race, HIV, and as we again talk about comorbidities. Oftentimes when we talk about adolescents who are living with HIV, we really focus on the continuum and uh, where youth, unfortunately, in 13 to 24, even in the 25 to 34, have the lowest rates of engagement in care, receipt of care, and viral suppression compared to all other ages. But young people are more than their viral load and you know, I've been hitting the drum and I'm so glad to be giving this talk today, talking about the things that are beyond viral load when we're thinking about optimizing care for young people. So I really appreciate the thinking about the life course perspective for adolescents with HIV. We're not just thinking about their medications, but thinking about all the things that happen to them in their second decade of life, but also throughout antibiotic medications and how they change and the impact that it has on them, in, again, in early and later on in life, critically important. So how will adolescents with HIV infection be impacted? In, in, increasingly, when we talk about other populations in terms of young people and HIV, but we really critically need to think about what's happening to all the parts of their bodies. This is what we look at in terms of the leading cause of death in the US among all populations. I think important to talk about this because we, Think about HIV, but there's so many other things that also are impacting our young people beyond the HIV. When you look at those in the 10 to 14 and 15 to 24, these are the rates of or who, what they're dying from with unintentional injury being number one, suicide being number two, and you see suicide is really prominent in the top 10 for all ages. So I think when we think about those young people before us and what we're trying to prevent, we also are thinking about all these other things that they may be at risk for cardiovascular disease, liver disease, diabetes, all making the top 10 for young people. 
talk about diabetes. So the percentage of adults in the U.S. with diabetes as of 2016 by age and ethnicity is expected. The older you get, the more likely you are to have diabetes. When you look in the 18 to 29 year old age, which falls, gets into the adolescent range, you still see that there are 3% of individuals 18 to 29 who are African-American uh, have diabetes. When you look at adolescents who are living with HIV specifically, the FACTS cohort, the Pediatric HIV AIDS cohort study, reports about 15% of the adolescents in that study having some evidence of insulin resistance. And this is higher compared to HIV exposed uninfected individuals, which is one of the unique features of the, of the pediatric HIV AIDS cohort study. Now, where is diabetes most prevalent? And this is just not among adolescents, this is among all individuals. What you see in the dark red and the, the, the darker gradations of red are the states where there are high prevalence of diabetes among all individuals. We know this map very well because these are the rates of adolescents living with HIV and they overlie the same locations. So again, we must be thinking about intersectionality. Prevalence of hypertension among adolescents in the US and in the, 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 uh, the 18 to 39 or, or represent the, um, in terms of the 18 to 39 are on the, on the dark bars, apologize, the blue bars. But 22% of individuals um, between 18 to 39 have uh, a diagnosis of hypertension, 31% of, ma of males and 13% of females. When you specifically look at adolescents living with HIV, and this data is challenging, the studies are all over the place and we hopefully will get better data soon, but among adolescent boys, about 15 to 19% have some sign of, of uh, elevated blood pressure. Adolescent females, seven to 12%. Among HIV positive youth, about 20%, um, are thought to have HIV. And this is uh, data from Science et al. And so we are anticipating that the rates are going to be higher among individuals living with HIV. Let me make sure I'm clear on this slide. This is adolescent boys, not just HIV positive adolescent boys, 15 to 19%. So have some issue with blood pressure. And again, cross sectional data, we're not 100% sure. And then some studies reporting about 20% for youth living with HIV. This data is oftentimes very confounded. There are issues with how uh, the studies are, are gotten and what's this, this diagnosis or said to be hypertension, but there's some signal that the rates may be higher among HIV positive. When we think about cardiovascular disease, I, I like this graph because it shows all the things that may come into play when we, we talk about cardiovascular disease. We had a lot of debate and discussion about ERT, abacavir, inhibitors, what role they may have in cardiovascular disease. And we do know that HIV itself it, with its effects on the vasculature may have an increased risk for, for cardiovascular disease as we've seen over several years from SMART and beyond. This is the 23 year old with HIV uh, with longstanding uncontrolled HIV and acute chest pain. He was admitted for another reason, had acute chest pain. And even with this EKG and the long ways from reading EKGs, which showed marked ST elevations, there was a question about whether or not he had, or could it be? No, he was. He had full on, which you can see is a beautiful um, lesion in this LAD, and he had an acute MI at 23 years of age, and this was reported by Dr. Griffin. So what is the cardiovascular data for youth with HIV? Studies of children and youth in non-HIV states, diabetes, obesity, do link arterial stiffness and thickness to hypertension and increased left ventricular size. Now, this is important because they may not show necessarily uh, heart attacks or heart outcomes as MIs in that young population, but certainly arterial thickness and stiffness have been associated with, with heart disease and, and mind, et cetera. So these young people with a perinatal acquired HIV have increased arterial thickness, they have increased arterial stiffness, and they have increased inflammatory markers compared to those that are HIV negative. And these markers are associated with arterial thickness, stiffness, and low median rotation, all signs of how well your vasculature is, is working or not working. It's important to say in, these increased inflammatory markers have been shown to exist despite long-standing biologic suppression. So elegant studies by Debbie Prasad and her lab have shown individuals who have been uh, suppressed on antibiotic medication for 10, 15 years or apparently acquired still have elevated uh, markers of inflammation compared to the HIV exposed uninfected. And so while we may not be seeing tons of heart outcomes, even though I showed you one, is this a harbinger for bad things to come? And I think the answer is, is yes. We do have an inkling of what long-term uh, morbidity for uh, HIV uh, positive um, with or without each, um, ART, what we're seeing. And this is data from Ann Nealon uh, in, in the uh, facts and, and 
and impact cohorts showing what young people uh, were presenting with these are adolescents and young adults, the incidence and in, in what their mortality was caused by over the under first years. And what you see are things that we normally think about, STI, pregnancy is not a morbidity, mental health, um, tears bacterial infections, cardiac conditions. So significant signs that there are, when morbidity, when mortality happens, these are the things that are contributing to that mortality. Let's talk about a few of those things. So mental health, there is more and more data about the impact of HIV, comorbidities, stigma, polypharmacy, all the things that may be impacting young people or people in general living with HIV. I think the, the issue of young people with HIV is that these factors, and particularly ART and HIV, are present for a lifelong. What does that mean? For reproductive health, I think it's important to talk about. STI rates among adolescents living with HIV um, are, are, are equivalent or similar to what we see in the general population. So it's important to say, and Khalil Ghanem will talk about this more, but the rates of gonorrhea, chlamydia, and syphilis are, are, have increased between 2013 and 2017 among individuals 15 to 24 years of age. They've increased. Highest among young women, but males have seen an increase of 29%, females 9%, gonorrhea of 52%, and females up 24%. And we can debate, is it increased incidence? Is it increased screening? Is it extra gender screening? What we can't debate is that young people have the highest rates and those rates have increased. Among HIV positive adolescents, those who are perinatally acquired, they may have an increased likelihood to use condoms, particularly if it's linked to when they know they're, they're disclosed, their status, et cetera. However, 60% of them use those condoms inconsistently. And 30% of studies that are done have one, at least one or more concurrent partners. For those that are non perinatally acquired, they do continue sexual activity and there is significant high levels of inconsistent condom use. And when we've looked at pregnancy desires among young people, uh, with HIV, perinatally or non-perinatally, pregnancy desires are unchanged compared to the regular population. So when we think about comorbidities, this is just looking at chlamydia infection and what we can think about for long-term comorbidities that include to build for infertility, adverse pregnancy outcomes. There are reasons why we need to be doing the testing, screening to interrupt and treat. Step back and say, what are the non-modifiable risk factors and what are the modifiable risk factors? I think as someone who sees young people, I'm constantly thinking about that. How can I get to this before it becomes a thing, right? And so some things we can't control or can't control, age, gender, genetic factors, race, ethnicity, I don't have to tell this group this, but there are things that are in the modifiable uh, category, smoking, diabetes, physical inactivity, high blood cholesterol, that we have got to highlight higher as a, a higher priority for young people to interview. Let's talk a bit more about that. So tobacco use among adolescents, on the right side of the slide is what you see among high school students with about 24% of high school students reporting some tobacco, use of some tobacco product. And what you see is e-cigarettes, cigars, there are a variety of, of, of tobacco products and many of them that adolescents don't realize are tobacco products due to their marketing, things like black and wild and cigarillos and things that are flavored and targeted to use that young people don't realize for tobacco and have nicotine that can actually be dangerous for their health. When studies look specifically at young people with HIV, up to 40% report some tobacco use with 20% reporting daily slash almost daily tobacco use. And again, you have to specifically, when you ask young people, it be specific about what you're using. So not just asking about a cigarettes, but cigarillos, and, and then which cigarillos and how and where. Many of these, again, targeted young people and they don't realize that they are. Obesity, I don't have to tell this group that the obesity is an epidemic in this country. And this is obesity greater than 95th percentile of the BMI. But 21% of 12 to 19 year olds are obese in the US. And again, showing highlighting the map, obesity is highest in those areas that happen to intersect where the, the highest areas of high HIV so incidence and prevalence. Among Hispanic young youth, 26%, 24% about among Blacks, and about 16% among non-Hispanic whites. In studies that have looked at both at obesity among US youth with HIV, 49% overweight obese. And again, this does have some variability depending on which cohort you look at. But definitely when you look at sort of the, the, the type of obesity or the type of the body dimension method metrics, youth with HIV, 10% higher trunk to fat ratio compared to then, then HEUs, which increases again, the type of fat distribution that increases the risk for cardiovascular disease. We've talked a lot about weight gain uh, yesterday with Dr. Um, 
with Roger Bedimo. And the data on INSTEs and adolescents with, with HIV is still emerging. Uh, and, and I hope that my group as well as others will add more data. This is from uh, Adeline Koi at, uh, at DC Children's looking at their cohort of young people with HIV. And while it may seem really messy, what you're looking at is a, is a general trend line for adolescents who are, are, were changed to NC regimens with a general trend for, trend for increase in, in weight. So again, we need to be thinking about the life, life course, what is treatment, what are the comorbidities, the long-standing comorbidities that may, uh, may uh, rise, and how do we intervene? But I don't want to talk doom and gloom for long, long periods of time. The question is, what can you do? And I put this on the right side of the slide again, what the leading causes of, of, of death among people in the US of all ages, but I really want us to focus our attention on those 10 to 24, um, which is the adolescent young adult period. So first it's to take a really good history. And that's every time you see that young person, assess the risk factors, like tobacco, and we already talked about the, the, the wide spectrum of tobacco and nicotine products, and also asking about other substances, asking about sexual activity um, in, in, in very non-judgmental, non-stigmatizing ways that allow the adolescent and the young person to, to let you know what they're actually engaging in. And then asking about, asking about other activities, including activities that may result in unintentional injury, asking about helmets, asking about firearms in the home, making that be part of your history. And then taking a detailed family history. And not just the first time you see adolescents, because you remember when you're seeing an adolescent, many of them may have parents that are in the early, late 30s, early 40s, but we should be asking family history again and again, because that history is also evolving and that may inform what needs to happen in terms of their history. And then of course, a physical examination, looking for things like stria or acanthosis nigrans that may give us some clue to insulin resistance and other concerns. What else can you do? Education, and I'm excited to have this talk today and really looking forward to the discussion because when we look at uh, what's happening in terms of screening, et cetera, oftentimes these are not even thought to be an issue for, for adolescents. Well, what, do we need to know about that? And the answer is yes. So educating both the patients as well as the staff that we do need to be thinking about that. And then counseling, and this is, this is tough because when I, I did take, remove a slide about the, the unhealthy habits that adolescents can engage in. Really, we can put adolescents or anybody in that age cat at any age. But in terms of nutrition, if I had a dollar for every time an adolescent said, oh, I could eat whatever I want, I'd never gain weight, I would be very rich because I've seen now some of these individuals for 10, 15 years, and they certainly have gained weight over time, all, not all related to their industry. Talking about exercise and, and intensely counseling about exercise and then offering opportunities and linking people to exercise and to thinking about that. And I keep harping on tobacco, nicotine, cigarettes, vapes, cigarillos, e-cigs. I have a, a handout that I give young people. And it's amazing that how many times they, that they say, oh, I, I didn't realize that was that had nicotine or that had tobacco, right? It just it's cherry flavor, vanilla flavor, and, and doing some education. And then talking about substance use. Again, non-judgmental, really trying to tease out. When I talked about cigarette use in terms of substance use in general. In the same fact studies, about 20% or one in five young people um, endorse some alcohol use. And again, they oftentimes distinguish, you know, cooler is not a is not a is not hard or clear liquor or what, but they are engaging in some sub, in some alcohol use. And we do know the earlier the young people start, the more likely it becomes an ingrained habit. So an opportunity to intervene. And then act, asking about other substances. There is increasing use of methamphetamines among young people, again, which may impact behaviors, which may impact um, risk of STI acquisition um, and leading to comorbidities. And then asking about sex in multiple ways, uh, not just for STI prevention, but counseling for pregnancy and among all populations of young people, um, as oftentimes our sexual activity may not uh, match our sexual um, you know, identity. Etc. And it's whatever else it should also be. Talk a moment about screening. So of course we should be getting a blood pressure according to the HIV primary care guidelines. We should be getting lipids, um, fasting slash non fasting, whatever you can get. Getting lipids, getting glucose, and we talk a little bit about A1Cs. Getting your baseline A1C, definitely glucose. Um, given the the concerns with NCs affecting A1Cs, subsequently it's difficult to use that for monitoring. But if we do use it, you want to look for an A1C that's greater than 6.5% in terms of the signs of diabetes. And then monitoring weight, making sure they get on the scale and, and monitoring the weight to see what happens with it. 
in terms of the risk calculators for adolescents with a question mark. When you look at all the different heart disease calculators on the age ranges that they're ideal for, they really don't include adolescents. And this is, I actually did this. I took the heart disease risk calculator and put in an adolescent of 18 and literally this is what pops up. This is not for this calculator, this population. This is not accurate. So what can you do? Again, actions. Because I talked about screening and, and figuring out that young people have issues, but what are the actions that come out of it? And so smoking cessation, we, we, we can, young people are, are able to, to engage in the in use of, of smoking cessation tools and, and referring them and, and, and prescribing them is important. Lifestyle modification, counseling, they may not hear you the first time or the second time or the third time, but it's, it's there nagging, but making it part of your visits. Um, and then treatment, if, if, if but lifestyle modification does not work and you have a, an adolescent who continues to have an elevated blood pressure, uh, it, uh, barring issues with the kidney or renal artery stenosis, which you should think about for young people, you, you do want to, to treat to get them their blood pressure within goal. Hyperlipidemia. This is an area where there oftentimes there's lots of questions. Well, what's the benefit for older youth? If there's Clear, abnormal, elevated lipids, you got fasting lipids, but currently there is benefit in addition to diet and, and, and exercise to, to treating those adolescents. And then weight loss, particularly with, with high rates of, of uh, obesity in certain populations, you know, referring to structured weight loss interventions and even um, potentially interventions to actually surgery, et cetera, for, for young people is something we need to think about. Addressing hyperlipidemia, really critical. Substance use treatment, early, frequent, often, address, and then refer. And then of course, STI counseling, screening, treatment, family planning, really critical. And again, for all youth, oftentimes I, 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 we talk about young men living with HIV, many of those who are uh, MSM, no one asks them, asks them about their pregnancy intentions or, or childbearing intentions. And many of them do have those. And so talking to them about what their plans are early often, again, critically important. And one last, I wanna talk briefly about immunization. In this graphic, what you see on the right is, is the percentage of adolescents who are up to date on HPV vaccination. And it's really abysmal. National coverage rates are 49% or lower. And we, luckily this is talking before um, Dr. Wilkins talks, who's gonna talk about uh, you know, cancers and things related to HPV, really critical to intervene early um, in terms of getting young people HPV vaccination. And then hepatitis A vaccination, hepatitis B vaccination, Tdap, MCV, uh, flu, and now COVID, PCV and, and PS23 can prevent and decrease risk of comorbidity. So in conclusion, adolescents with HIV, whether perinatally or not, are surviving into adulthood, and many of them in, in spaces that are not necessarily appreciated that they're there. Providers must be aware of the potential comorbidities that may arise in adolescents that then set in for adulthood. It is critically important to start screening for and address comorbidities with prevention and early treatment for adolescents born with and those who acquired HIV. And with that, I will stop and uh, yield two min additional minutes to question and answer. Thanks so much. I was just trying to get back on screen. Uh, thanks so much, Allison. That was a great talk. So. Um, one of the things that really struck me when we had some listening sessions with adolescents many several years ago, because we had such low rates of our suppression in Ryan, the Ryan White program, we were trying to figure out what we should do differently. Um, the thing that struck me that I, we heard several different times in different places is, I am more than my viral load. Like all my doctor cares about is my viral load. I don't wanna see that doctor. Yeah. Um, so it seems like adolescents are much more sort of uh, sensitive to that issue that we are really focused on viral load. You want to talk about that a little bit in terms of engaging adolescents? Yeah, so that's why I had that slide with all the tattoos, et cetera. I am greater than viral load. Um, I'm, you know, greater than my value. And that's actually uh, stolen initially from the, the diabetes literature where young people, I'm more than my, my A1C. And, and, and they are. And I think there, there is frustration. You go in and adolescents, we know, have the lowest rates of viral suppression. We do know that. We also know that there's so many things intersecting to why they get there. And I really pride Ryan White for all the things that the resources that are provided within the program to support adolescents. But absolutely, you, you talk about the viral load and you address the viral load, but you also, that's within the context of their entire lives. And so you're absolutely right. You, you don't want to harp on it so much. You have to address it. 
Um, but if you're addressing the other things and supporting, et cetera, you're going to get to the viral load in my mind um, by addressing the other things that are impacting. Great, thanks. We've got some great questions here. One is, what is the impact of INSTEs on hemoglobin A1C? Is that known? Yeah, so you know, I, I don't know that I completely understand the mechanism, but we do know that the, the integrase inhibitors cause sort of an a, a artificial increase in the A1C. And so it's not as reliable for monitoring for diagnosis of, of, of diabetes. So you have to be careful and use the fast, using the fasting glucose or glucose challenge to be able to divide. I'm happy for anybody to comment on the mechanism. I don't know that I completely understand the mechanism of why they see was supposed to be elevated. Yeah, so in the adult treatment, in the adult guidelines, um, A1C is not recommended for the diagnosis of diabetes as it is uh, in primary care because of that. Mm -hmm. So Exactly. Um, the other question was based on what you said. So at what LDL would you start uh, statins in an adolescent? Yeah, so that's a really good question. I mean, of, of course, you know, you. The, the number is usually 130 or higher is, is, is what's recommended with the goal of getting to below 100 is what's, what's recommended. Um, I oftentimes, it's one more thing to add to it. So I really push the lifestyle and things with, with a goal to not add it. But if we have persistent elevations, et cetera, I, I, I am concerned I, I, and I do add, but it's a rare adolescent that I use. Yeah, another question is a lot of uh, adolescents, at least one practice here are using uh, or a lot of their high risk uh, sexual activity is, is coming through places like Grindr. And how do you, how do you address that uh, kind of social media platforms uh, with patients specifically around risk? Yeah, that's really a great question. I mean, I think first, um, I'm really excited that people are even asking where young people are having sex and getting the answers sort of back in Grindr, right? So even understanding where, where the risk is. So, I think, how do you address it? I think certainly we talk about what you see is not what you get and, and talk about how to be safe, even just physical safety um, when you're meeting people on Jack and Grinder. So I literally meeting them where they are in terms of, okay, so you mean them and who do you tell or how do you tell to just talk about safety? And then we talk about, you know, those sort of the, the what, what you see in terms of knowing that on social, the social network, sexual network sites, that there are actually significant studies have been done, the significant proportion of those individuals are not necessarily truthful about their HIV status or their PrEP status, et cetera. So we talk a little bit about that. And then we just talk about, well, what's the best way to remain safe? It doesn't really help to say, well, don't have meet your partners on Jack or Grinder, particularly when people are not necessarily out in their communities, et cetera. Those are the safe spaces that they feel to meet their partners. So it's how do you help young people navigate that space in the way that's safe for them without wagging the finger and saying you should not, or couldn't, or should not do that. Great, and uh, getting back to kind of harm reduction, what are the current age recommendations for HPV vaccine? Yeah, so the age recommendations are similar to for, for negative individuals. I believe it starts at 10, it's 10, the, the starting age for 10, and I think it's 26 for um, the for male. So that whole age range, um, 10, to, 10 to 26, I believe is the range, with some leverage to go older. Um, but Tim Wilkin, I see his answering, so he could jump in and type and answer that, that one and make sure I didn't get it right. I give all my youth, you know, but it's usually starting at age 10 and, and up to age 10. Okay, great. And um, given everything you said about comorbidities and antiretrovirals, what, is, what are your go-to or favorite antiretrovirals for uh, youth? Yeah, so, and no, no bias. And I, I, I also should say that I, I, I do sit. So thank you, it's kind of ninth and but thank you. Um, I sit on the DHH guidelines, but these are my, my opinions in terms of what I recommend for go to for start. Um, so my goal is smallest, less frequent, fewer side effects. And for me, what I have found uh, seems to fit that bill with the current regimens that we have is the, the, the Victarvi based regimen. So BICTEF FDC has, has been what I, I have found that has, has fit, in, fit the bill for that. Prior to that, I was using a, a lot of the two uh, pill regimens, and that was dolutegravir and uh, FTC TAF. And again, the, young, the small pill of that dolutegravir just would get people so excited. Oh, I can swallow that. It's amazing how many young people don't swallow pills. And if we don't ask the question about, can you swallow pills and show them the pill, et cetera, we miss that they can't swallow pills. And so we do a lot of pill training and swallowing, et cetera, to get them there. But you've got to ask the question, to then figure out what works for them. So that tends to be my first line. Is, is that right? Yeah, I've seen some amazing pill um, swallowing programs when I've been around the country visiting. 
Um, so for patients who don't have metabolic syndrome um, and are on uh, a back of ear, which because they were started a while ago, would you keep them on a back of ear? So that's a great question. And we had some discussion yesterday about, well, what do we know about a back of ear and did it get a bad rap or, or, or not? So if somebody is doing really well on their back of ear, uh, including regimen, for example, they happen to be on, on the Triamec um, tablet, for example, I wouldn't necessarily change them. Um, however, if we are starting to see someone has hypertension that's going, they, there's some metabolic issues going on, there's other things where I'm thinking, well, let's, I, I'm concerned about the, the, the comorbidities down the line. I certainly would consider switching them to something. Great, thank you. And for people that are diagnosed perinatally or at a young age between 13 and 18 are now transitioning into adult care, what are some of the major things you think we should be thinking about? I know there's a breakout that some people will be able to attend today, but can you sort of give a high level, uh, what are the things that we should be doing in, uh, at, in adult medicine to help retain these people in care? Yeah, that's a great question that I spend a lot of time thinking a lot about, and I do hope people go to the breakout session. I think, you know, first here, in, in most programs, young people are transitioning um, or staying in pediatric programs up to the age of 25, right? And then going to the adult side. Um, if you're transitioning young, a young person at 13 to 18 or close to 18, there are different things that you need to be thinking about than if they're older. That being said, I think the things that I have found and I think our team has found that work best is number one, making sure that there's disclosure in a way that the young person now understands. At around 10 years of age is what usually is the recommendation to make sure young people know their, their, their status. However, what you know at 10 when you get that disclosed status versus what you evolve into at 18 or 20 is very different. And so giving young people space and grace to understand or to revisit disclosure. It's so like, well, we already did that at 10 years of age and, and now you're 16, why are you asking again? Because now the realization of what that disclosure means may be different because now they're thinking about what that means to tell partners or this or that. And so making sure that there is an understanding of disclosure and what it means for them and, and who owns the disclosure story, I think works really well. We know when we do that well, lower rates of, of, of depression, higher rates of adherence, better engagement in care, so that's one. I think two, not taking for granted that young people understand what HIV is the impact on them. And again, even if you had lifelong HIV, for the most part, there's been someone else managing your care, a parent or caregiver, and you may not actually understand. And so taking the time to say, well, what do you understand about your HIV and making sure and empowering that young person around the HIV. Making sure that there's some medical literacy. And so how do you call for your appointments? What, how do you get your medication refill? And actually testing to make sure people know how to do that, right? What are the rules around this and how do you do that? What is really important? Making sure as they're transitioning to the adult side, they're not forgetting that many young people have been on that PED side for many, many, many years. And that is their family in a lot of cases, particularly if there's a lot of death and other things happening in their family, the clinical staff, that's their family. And so it's trauma and loss to move to that adult side. So making align, aligning the adult center or clinic aligning with the feed center. And so you become a trusted individual that the family is brought in that then you can then take over, right? It's like someone taking you to the carnival. So invite them to the house. This is auntie, adult doctor. I'm going to take you to the carnival, right? So it's, it's making alliances and having a feedback loop that's really critical. So do definitely talk through some of these things more in the, in the breakout, but those are the things that we find really works well is supporting them. And I think one more thing, it's making sure again, they're more than their viral loads. So it's not just the medication. We should be doing a, here is the full summary of what's happening with that young person, social, every, all the pieces. And it should be a complete handoff to the side and making sure there's some feedback to make sure that, that we're on the same page once more. A couple of more antiretroviral questions. So um, are there any specific antiretrovirals you recommend with specific comorbidities you see in youth? And should we be worried about using tenofovir and a given bone development and the importance of maximizing bone development in your early 20s? That's a great question. So let me make sure I understood. So one, are there any active retrovirals that I tend to avoid to make sure that I minimize the risk of comorbidities? And then a question about tenofovir. Or specific comorbidities where if they have this, I never, you know, I never use that, like a common yeah. comorbidity. Yeah, so I think that, um, you know, certainly there was some discussion yesterday about, you know, weight and when you use NCs and, and when, you, when you don't, et cetera. You know, I, I don't restrict them with weight. I do a lot of counseling. 
I have switched the young pork and gained 30 pounds in one year from an in-state because I just couldn't. So I, I do think about it. And I say, well, which one may have the, lowest, the least impact? So I do think about it. I think certainly if somebody has, um, if for some reason there's some brittle bone or something like that, I would, would avoid tenofovir. Most of the young people starting on regimens, I'm, I'm, I'm starting on TAP-based regimens. Um, however, you know, in terms of the bone loss issue, when we look at data from ATN, for example, looking at TDF and impact on bone, we did see some um, impact on bone, though it was not necessarily clinically significant. And these were young people who were starting a war on for prep. Interestingly, they started with bone mineral densities that were already a little lower, even without um, software in the mix. And that may be related to, to lack of exercise or, or a number of issues. So I think I, I, it does concern me with, with the TDF, even though I'm not sure what it means clinically. Um, so I was happy to move away from tap based residents, which is why the weight gain and all that that's, that's become an issue is, is, uh, is challenging for, for me to think through. And so um, may need to switch again or think more about that. Great, and a couple more questions about some cognitive challenges. Um, you, you'd mentioned those. Are adolescents more likely to have a diagnosis of ADHD and need uh, potentially do better on stimulants, first question. And the second question is, what do you do when you have an adolescent and you think they might have Asperger's that hasn't yet been diagnosed, but you think there's a, a cognitive, a cognitive uh, difference that uh, may need to be uh, understood so people can be managed appropriately? So there, the, the, I can take both questions. So there, there have been, I'm trying to think relative to the general population. I don't know that higher than the general population. I'd have to double check. Certainly higher rates of depression, et cetera, are seen in that population. ADHD, I'm not sure there has been, um, been shown. Um, certainly in terms of stimulants, I think if there is ADHD diagnosed, that you, you would use stimulants. And there are studies that have looked at the interaction of potential for stimulants and and an ADHD medicines that point to impact 10, don't miss quote, 1080, looked at those interactions and, and I looked at drug levels to show that they, they were not altered, but I'm happy for when the pharmacist did to do that, but you certainly would use them if you need them. In terms of if you think there's some cognitive issue, and we do know that there are higher rates of cognitive issues among um, young people who are um, acquired and those living with HIV, then we do recommend doing the cognitive testing out if that's available to you. Um, definitely doing it because that does then allow them to, to be able to access resources to support them because we do know that longitudinally that would impact their engagement and care and, and, and the like. So really critical to, to do to diagnose if you think that's what they're doing. And one last quick question. Is there a special or different approach you should take towards tackling depression in perinatal in, in people who have perinatal transmission of their HIV? That's a great question. I think certainly, uh, one, it's, it's just to address the depression. I think certainly um, it's important to, to really, un, when you're managing their depression, not just thinking about them, but thinking about the entire context. There are some studies looking at CBT and other modalities to, that have been shown to be additive and improved in addition to, to medication. Um, so I think it's just no, understand that their context may be different. There's in, in stigma, there's multi-layered and not separating that from the, the depression diagnosis itself. It's, it's completely hand in hand. Great, well, thank you so much. That was a wonderful uh, presentation. And I know that um, they are, we are uh, increasingly seeing these adolescents transi transition to adult care. So that was very helpful. Um, with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Dr. Sag for our next speaker. Thank you, Dr. Agri. Thanks, guys. Wonderful start to the morning. 